dictionary defines an environmentalist as a person who's concerned about <clears throat> or advocates protection of the environment. The dictionary offers as synonyms the terms conservationist, preservationist, ecologist, and nature lover. Articles on the subject generally imply that environmentalism is a relatively new phenomenon. They publish lists of so-called early environmentalists with familiar names like John James Audubon, Henry David Thoreau, and Ansel Adams. They say that the environmentalist movement took off in the United States after the Second World War and got a big boost from the publication of Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. And they include among modern environmentalists such names as Ralph Nader, Jane Fonda, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Al Gore. But these secular lists of prominent environmentalists fail to include the very first environmentalist, Almighty God, our Creator. Welcome to Bible Nook's worship service. Pastor David Reed has authored numerous books, served as a contributing editor of Dr. Walter Martin's Christian Research Journal, taught at Spurgeon's in London, and pastored Emmanuel Baptist Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He now provides these worship services for individuals at home and free to use by small groups and churches. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us with the privilege of turning to your word, the Bible, to learn more about you. And we thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us through your creation, the wonderful and beautiful things that surround us everywhere on earth. We pray your blessing now on all who join us and on the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together in singing, A Wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry thirsty land. He hideth my life with the depths of his love, and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his a wonderful Saviour is Jesus my Lord, He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved, He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life with the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessings each moment he crowns and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life with the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his when clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, 
I'll shout with the millions on high. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shatters a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life with the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When the disciples asked our Lord Jesus to teach them how to pray, he gave them the words of the Our Father prayer, a prayer that Christians have been repeating for almost 2,000 years now. Let's each of us make it our own prayer as we repeat those words together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In addition to these live streamed services, Bible Nook provides books and Bibles that you can obtain in printed form on Amazon.com and through bookstores, and that you can download for free in digital form at BibleNook.com. Our videos of worship services and individual messages remain available for streaming at YouTube.com slash BibleNook and at facebook.com slash Bible Nook Ministry. These live streamed services are aimed at providing traditional worship services for believers who otherwise would not have them because they're confined to the home or because they don't have a nearby church that sings traditional hymns and preaches Bible messages. And they're also aimed at reaching the world with messages proclaiming and upholding the gospel of Christ. We pay Facebook to boost our messages, and we pay Google to advertise our YouTube messages, with the result that the thought-provoking thumbnails have reached millions of people, and Facebook and YouTube report hundreds of thousands of views by people who watch and listen. For example, more than 80,000 views were reported for our message on the signs leading up to Christ's return, and about 85,000 views for our message don't count on a second chance if you're left behind. Our other messages are reaching additional thousands each week. No one takes any salary from Bible Nook. All the gifts we receive go directly to spreading the gospel message. If the Lord moves your heart to spend some of your resources on this gospel outreach, you can do so by visiting BibleNook.com and clicking the Donate button on the home page, or by sending a check to Bible Nook 214 Onset Avenue, Suite 1464, Onset, Massachusetts, 02558. Today's scripture reading is from Psalm 104, beginning with the first verse. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills, giving drink to every wild animal. The wild asses quench their thirst. By the streams, the birds of the air have their habitation. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for people to use, to bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the human heart, oil to make the face shine, and bread to strengthen the human heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests, the stork has its home in fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, 
The rocks are a refuge for the conies. You have made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows its time for setting. You make darkness and it is night when all the animals of the forest come creeping out. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they withdraw and lie down in their dens. People go out to their work and to their labor until the evening. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. May the Lord add his blessing to our reading of his word. Let's join together now in singing America the Beautiful. Dictionary defines an environmentalist as a person who is concerned about or advocates protection of the environment. The dictionary offers as synonyms the terms conservationist, preservationist, ecologist, and nature lover. Articles on the subject generally imply that environmentalism is a relatively new phenomenon. They publish lists of so-called early environmentalists with familiar names like John James Audubon, Henry David Thoreau, and Ansel Adams. They say that the environmentalist movement really took off in the United States after the Second World War and got a big boost from the publication of Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, and they include among modern environmentalists such names as Ralph Nader, Jane Fonda, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Al Gore. But these secular lists of prominent environmentalists fail to include the very first environmentalist, Almighty God, our Creator. In fact, news articles often portray Bible-believing Christians 
as somehow anti-environment and anti-conservation. That irritates me because it's an insult to God, our creator. He's really the first environmentalist, the greatest environmentalist. Psalm 104 says, O Lord, my God, you are very great. You make springs gush forth in the valleys, giving drink to every wild animal. And I'm skipping down here to pick out the highlights. You cause the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for people to use, to bring forth food from the earth. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests. You make darkness and it is night when all the animals of the forest come creeping out. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Almighty God gives drink to every wild beast of the field, providing water for the wild animals, and he waters the trees and the grass. He provides the habitat for all the birds and beasts. He made them all, and he created the ecosystem with all of its natural cycles, including the food chain. After creating the Garden of Eden and the first man, Adam, Genesis 2.15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The first man was assigned to take care of his environment. And when God sent the people of Israel later into the promised land, he commanded them to take care of their environment as well. Environmentalists are concerned by, over what they call intensive agriculture or over farming. Over farming can result in depleting soil nutrients and can even cause erosion of topsoil. To prevent that from happening, Modern conservationists develop theories of what they call sustainable agriculture. This involves placing limits on farming to keep the land from being over-farmed. They think they've come up with something new. Actually, however, it was God who first set limits on farming to ensure sustainable agriculture. God instructed Moses, according to Leviticus 25.2, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I am going to give you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. The land was to lie fallow after six years of farming. God continued in Leviticus 25 to say, Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in their yield. But in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of complete rest for the land. So besides commanding the people of Israel to rest on the seventh day, God also commanded a rest for the land. It was not to be farmed continually. Instead, it was to be left uncultivated for a full year every seven years. And then God went on in verse 8 of Leviticus chapter 5 to say, Count off seven groups of seven years, or 49 years. During that time, there will be seven years of rest for the land. And then after the 49 years, God added, Make the 50th year a special year. The 50th year will be a special time for you to celebrate. Don't plant seeds or harvest the crops that grow by themselves or gather grapes from the vines that are not trimmed. That year is Jubilee. It will be a holy time for you. So the land was to lie fallow for two years at the time of the Jubilee. The 49th year was one of those seven year rest years. And then the 50th year was a special year of rest for the land. This prevented the farmland from being overworked. And it wasn't a modern environmentalist who thought that up. It was God who commanded it. Long ago, through the prophet Isaiah, God condemned those who greedily abuse the land and who carry development to extremes. In Isaiah 5.8, he said, 
Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left. That is exactly the sort of urban sprawl and overdevelopment of the land that environmentalists fight against. And God, the first environmentalist, identified the problem and warned against it over 2,500 years ago when he said through Isaiah, Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left. One segment of the modern environmentalist movement focuses on preserving wildlife and on protecting animals from abuse, whether they're wild or domestic animals. But here too, the Bible was thousands of years ahead of these modern and naturalists and animal rights activists. The Bible book of Deuteronomy presents many of the laws God gave to Israel before they entered the promised land. And Deuteronomy chapter 22 instructs them to conserve wildlife. 22.6 says, If you happen to come upon a bird's nest along the way in any tree or on the ground with young ones or eggs, and the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall certainly let the mother go, but the young you may take for yourself in order that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. God allowed them to gather birds' eggs for food, but he prohibited them from taking the eggs and the mother bird. That would threaten the survival of that species of bird if the mother bird and her eggs were both consumed. But allowing the mother bird to go free helped ensure that the species would continue to reproduce. Notice, too, that God pointed out to the Israelites that preserving wildlife was in their own best interests. He concluded that environmentally friendly law by saying, in order that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. Yes, we are all interdependent. Destroying wildlife and harming our environment ultimately harms us, too, in the long run. That's why God told them to look out for the welfare of wild birds in order that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. This is another reminder that obeying God doesn't put a burden on us. Isaiah 48, 17 says, This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. Yes, whenever God tells us, do this or don't do that, it's for our own good. He teaches you what is best for you. Just like little children who don't understand why we tell them to eat their vegetables and not fill up on sugar and candy, we may not always understand why God says do this and don't do that. But we ought to trust him, knowing that he does this for our benefit. How we treat animals, whether wild or domestic, also reflects on us and our character. God cares about animals, and we should too. In Matthew 10, 29, Jesus said, What is the price of two sparrows, one copper coin? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. At Proverbs 12, 10, God said, a righteous man has regard for the life of his animal, but even the compassion of the wicked is cruel. Our God is righteous, and he is compassionate, and has regard for, even for the feelings of dumb animals. For example, at Deuteronomy 25, 4, he says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the grain. A muzzle would prevent the ox from eating any of the grain that it's threshing. It would be cruel to force the ox to work with that food right in front of it without being able to eat any of it. In his first letters to Timothy and the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul refers back to that passage in Deuteronomy to teach them that Christian workers deserve to be paid, just as the ox working among the grain 
deserves to be able to eat some of it. Just like muzzling an ox that's threshing out the grain, it would also be cruel to yoke animals together unevenly. Deuteronomy 22.10 commands, you must not plow with an ox and a donkey harnessed together. An ox is much bigger and stronger than a donkey. And if the two of them were to work by side by side, yoked together, it would put tremendous strain on the little donkey. At 2 Corinthians 6.14, the Apostle Paul seems to allude to this when he writes, Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So the principle would apply to human relationships. Marrying an unbeliever or entering a business partnership with an unbeliever would leave a Christian unequally yoked, like a donkey yoked together with an ox. It would end up causing the Christian unnecessary pain and discomfort in the long run. Of course, many Christians find themselves already yoked unequally in marriage to an unbeliever, and the Bible's advice in that situation is to make the best of it, for the Christian to do everything possible to be a loving mate and to preserve the marriage. One of the major concerns of environmentalists today is deforestation, the destruction of trees and woodland. God's laws given through Moses to ancient Israel in the book of Deuteronomy also place limits on cutting down trees, in particular during war. Deuteronomy chapter 20 says, when you besiege a city a long time to make war against it in order to capture it, you shall not destroy its trees by swinging an ax against them, for you may eat from them and you shall not cut them down. For is the tree of the field a man that it should be besieged by you? Only the trees which you know are not fruit trees you shall destroy and cut down, that you may construct siege works against the city that is making war with you until it falls. So God allowed the army to cut down non-fruit-bearing trees to build siege works, but aside from that, they could not just freely cut down all the trees. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, Jesus also talked about trees in one of his parables. In it, he spoke of a landowner who wanted to cut down a fig tree that didn't produce any figs for him. But the worker who cared for the trees asked him to spare the tree for another year. It's found in Luke, chapter 13, beginning at verse 6. And he began telling them this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. The landowner in the parable was eager for profit and quick to cut down a tree that appeared unprofitable. But the vineyard keeper, who worked closely with the trees, cared enough about this tree to give it more time and more tender care to help it become fruitful. Jesus gave that parable, of course, to illustrate something. And what he was illustrating was God's patience with the nation of Israel. At the point, and the point was the same as the one that Jesus made in Matthew 21, 43, when he said, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. When God sent his son to the nation of Israel, he found them not producing the fruits of the kingdom. Still, he kept working with them for a while. It was like the tree that was spared from being cut down so that it could be fertilized for a while longer through Jesus' ministry on earth. A small remnant of Jews accepted Jesus, but the nation as a whole failed to produce the fruits of the kingdom, 
and so the tree was cut down. The kingdom of God was taken from them and given to a people who will produce its fruit. The kingdom was given to the Christian congregation, made up of people from all nations. For thousands of years now, God has been patient with this world and with mankind as a whole. Jesus has sent his people out preaching the gospel to all nations, and many people have listened and repented and turned to Christ as to follow and obey him. But the world as a whole continues to revel in sin, even embracing sin more openly and boldly than previous generations. There is first the sin of rejecting God and rejecting his son, who he sent to be our king. But there are also all the other sins that this world now elevates as virtues. The sin of greed is elevated as the world heaps praise on the rich and powerful. The sin of sexual immorality is elevated as this world honors promiscuous and perverted individuals as stars and celebrities, even celebrating Pride Month in honor of sexual perversion. And there's also the sin of destroying the environment. God is the first environmentalist, and he long ago announced his intention to punish those who destroy the environment. Revelation 11:18 says, And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. Yes, Revelation 11:18 says that God will destroy those who destroy the earth. The modern environmentalist movement has only modest accomplishments to point to. Humans are still destroying the earth, but our Creator has promised that He will destroy those who destroy the earth. And then Revelation 21.1 goes on to say that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Isaiah chapter 65 describes that new earth. God says, Look, I will make new heavens and a new earth. Wolf and lambs will eat together in peace. Lions will eat hay like oxen. They will not hurt or destroy each other on all my holy mountain. So the first environmentalist, the great environmentalist, the one who created our environment in the beginning, he will step in forcefully at the return of Christ. He will keep his promise to destroy those who destroy the earth. As we pray in the Our Father prayer, God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He will make a new earth restored to the beauty and the perfection of the Garden of Eden. Peace will prevail even among the animals, and there will be no more threats to the environment, because the first environmentalist will restore the earth to the condition he originally intended for it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word, the Bible, as the original environmentalist, the first environmentalist, the one who teaches us to care for the world around us, to care for the animals, to treat them lovingly and kindly, and to preserve them and the environment. We thank you, Lord, that you have promised to step in with your mighty power to destroy those who are destroying the earth. And we pray for that time to come soon when your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together in singing for the beauty of the earth. For the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the sky, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Christ our God to thee we raise this 
is a sacrifice of praise for the beauty of each hour of the day and of the night hill and vale and tree and flower sun and moon and stars of light Christ our God to thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise for the joy of ear and eye for the heart and brain's delight for the mystic harmony linking sense to sound and sight Christ our God to thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise for the joy of human love brother sister parent child friends on earth and friends above for all gentle thoughts and mild christ our god to thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise for each perfect gift of thine to our race so Christ our God, to Thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the privilege of turning to Your Word to receive our instruction and to receive hope for the future. We thank you that the Bible gives us guidance for today and a reason to keep on living because we know that you offer us eternal life when we turn to you in repentance and receive Jesus as our Lord. We thank you, Lord, for providing the wonderful things in your word to strengthen us and help us through each day. We pray that you'll help us to keep these things in our hearts and minds and to share them on our lips. In Jesus' name, amen. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsel, God uphold you with his sheep securely fold. God be with you till we meet again, till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet, till we meet, till we meet, God be with you till we God bless. Keep safe.